Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session. The main objective uh, of this session uh, is to discuss uh, various strategies and tactics in the conduct of monetary policy. So, in the previous sessions we have covered, uh, we have discussed uh, various tools uh, that are being used uh, in the conduct of monetary policy. Our focus here will be uh, what are the further developments uh, in the conduct of monetary policy across the globe. So, visualizing a big picture how monetary policy have been used uh, in the management of macroeconomy. So, over the years since 1970, monetary policy has been seen to have two goals. One is to cushion the economy when it is hit by shocks, especially in the 1970s. And the other one uh, is to provide a stable environment of inflation and therefore inflationary expectation. So, this was in 1980s. So, the sequence of shifts in emphasis from monetary policy as risk management to policy as inflation expectation management has happened over time. So, you can recall from our previous discussions that is since 1930s to 1960s, 70s, the discussion was mainly between a choice between fiscal policy and monetary policy. So, because of the dominance of the Keynesian economics, early Keynesian economics uh, till 1930s to 1960s, uh, it was argued that it was found that uh, fiscal policy, actually fiscal policy gained over monetary policy. However, in the 1970s, because of the uprise of monetarism, uh, where monetarism argued that monetary policy can make impact on the economy, especially in the short run, uh, monetary policy, then people began to uh, appreciate the importance of uh, monetary policy as well uh, in the uh, economic policy. So, especially in the 1970s, when stagflation hit across the world, that means the high inflation with the low economic growth. And many countries, economies, they use monetary policy as a tool to counter the stagflation problem. So, the point however, uh, after 1970s, 90s, since 1970s, the debate between whether or not, whether monetary policy or fiscal policy, that question, that debate was over, that debate is over. Even Keynesians and new Keynesian also began to agree that monetary policy is also important. So, finally, an agreement came, a consensus came that both fiscal policy and monetary policies are important. Then the question came uh, more about further interest was on monetary policy. So, monetary policy, then it has been used as I mentioned one to cushion against if it is hit by shocks, a demand management or to ensure that the economy is on track. Another to ensure a stable environment of inflation and in order to reduce the inflationary expectations. So, the period of the so called great moder moderation from the uh, mid 1980s to 2000 appeared to diminish the need for active stabilization policies. Uh, it was mainly for not for to uh, as a part of macroeconomic stabilization, but to ensure a stable environment of inflation. So, that was the period from 1980s to 2006. But then after 2007, as you know, because of the 2007-89 crisis, because of the severe shocks return, monetary policy was again uh, in its crisis prevention mode. So, coming to then as I mentioned, uh, monetary policy, uh, the discussion, uh, the further interest was mo mostly on how to conduct monetary policy instead of a choice between uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. So, let me quote you, quote one statement from uh, Alan Blender. Uh, to him, uh, monetary policy is an art as well as a science. So, I am just uh, stating his statement. Uh, having looked at the monetary policy from both sides now, I can testify that uh, central banking in practice is as much art as science. 
So nonetheless, while practicing this dark art, I have always found the science quite useful. So over the past few decades, policy makers throughout the world have become increasingly aware of the social and economic cost of inflation uh, and more concerned with maintaining a stable price level as a goal of economic policy. So coming to the social uh, cost of inflation, uh, you have several empirical studies showed that uh, the inflation hits the poor most. And similarly, the economic cost, uh, if there is hyperinflation, uh, it has been found that a rise price level, uh, it creates uncertainty in the economy uh, and the uncertainty, that uncertainty might hamper economic growth as well. So in that way, both it affects both social, socially as well as economically. So as a result, um, the policy makers have been looking for uh, a nominal anger that means uh, because price stability is so crucial uh, in the long term health of an economy um, a central element is successful monetary policy is the use of a nominal anger that is a nominal variable such as inflation rate or the money supply that is the monetary aggregate which it ties down the price level to achieve price stability. So adherence to a nominal anger that keeps the nominal variable within a narrow range promotes price stability. Uh, it promotes price stability by directly promoting low and stable inflation expectation. However, there are other goals as well, other goals of monetary policy as well that includes uh, five other goals continuously mentioned by the central bank officials across the globe. This includes um, high employment and output stability, uh, economic growth, uh, stability in financial markets and interest rate stability and stability in foreign exchange markets. So in order to achieve this one, uh, all these goals. It actually mainly the discussion was centered around uh, mainly uh, two aspects. One is on the price stability, one is price stability, price stability and the other one is economic growth. Economic growth include um, growth in GDP as well as uh, employment, uh, stable employment level as well. So in the long run, no inconsistency exists between the price stability goal and other goals that we discussed. So there is a discussion uh, because of the price stability is crucial to the uh, lo long run growth of the economy. Many countries have decided that price stability, this one, the price stability should be the primary long run goal for central bank. So in this way, uh, because of that, um, countries began to use a uh, follow a hierarchical mandates that means uh, hierarchical mandates that are giving first priority to uh, prioritizing price stability over the economic growth. So important point you need to remember here suppose if the price stability is the important or countering uh, inflation is the priority then you know that as a result of money supply that uh, monetary policy the suppose a monetary policy suppose an expansionary monetary policy that is increase in money supply or th that is one increase in money supply directly or by reducing uh, rate of interest uh, through which increasing the money supply or either of this and the objective here is suppose if they increase the money supply then you know the rate of interest will decline. Uh, then as a result what is happening here is that there is the adverse impact of increase in price is going to happen. Because if there is too much liquidity in the economy that means too much money chasing few goods scenario may come up. So as a result we can say that inflation may happen, inflation may increase. So if expansionary monetary policy, if the countries follow expansionary monetary policy then you know that. Uh, inflation will be a adverse outcome of that as a result of expansionary monetary policy. At the same time, uh, is, is suppose if they want to uh, reduce this, uh, suppose if they prioritize inflation is their main challenge, then instead of increasing money supply, uh, they should be reducing money supply. That means reducing money supply by increasing rate of interest or in both ways it works, increasing rate of interest also will reduce money supply. So increasing rate of interest. So that means it is a 
contractionary monetary policy then the cost here is that if they follow a contractionary monetary policy obviously they can reduce uh, liquidity in the economy and the same because by through that route they can control inflation but the cost here is that when money supply is reduced and rate of interest is increased then you know that it will hamper economic growth you know why because low rate of interest means the cost of borrowing for productive units that the firms increase then as a result production of goods and services uh, will fall so that means if they they cannot uh, focus on both an expansionary monetary policy uh, is good for economic growth is good for economic growth but it will have uh, increase at the same time it will increase inflation so in this case they have to take choose either of these so in this case the mandate was that many countries they followed uh, hierarchical mandates that means mandates which put the goal of price stability first then state that other goals can be pursued as long as price stability is achieved because uh, price stability is crucial to the long run health of the economy many countries have decided that price stability should be the primary uh, long run uh, goal for the central bank so as i am i'm just taking a quote from uh, maastricht treaty which is created by the european central bank it states that the primary objective of the european system of central bank shall be to maintain price stability so that means they are following uh, the hierarchical mandate that means uh, giving more importance to the price stability then secondary importance once that one is achieved then they believe that other goals whichever we mentioned that the economic growth employment exchange rate stability etc can be achieved however in contrast to this there is uh, another mandate called dual mandate that means giving equal importance to both because long term interest rates will be very high if inflation is high uh, this statement in practice is a dual mandate to achieve two co equal objective that means both price stability and maximum employment that is the maximum output uh, both should be achieved so for example fed they give the dual mandate that means giving importance to both price stability uh, as well as uh, economic stability or output stability so we can again see that further um, as i mentioned in the beginning of this session there was great resurgence of interest on how to conduct monetary policy and you can see that there is increasing research on the topic uh, several research articles have been have been published on this topic topic and one of the tool tactics that we used discuss in the previous session is the john taylor's recommendation of a simple interest rate rule that is the fed fund rate rule should be uh, equal to the taylor rule it should follow the taylor rule that is one of the tactics and then recently there are widespread endorsement of inflation targeting as well so two main factors underlie uh, this rebirth of interest the first one uh, after a long period of near exclusive focus on the role of non monetary factors in the business cycle a stream of empirical work uh, beginning in the late 1980s has made the case for monetary policy significantly influences the short term courses of the real economy so both keynesians uh, and monetarism and believe that uh, monetary policy can significantly influence at least the short term uh, variables at least in the short run uh, it can help to influence the out output of the economy that means the gdp of the economy gdp uh, is inf- can be influenced uh, by monetary policy in the short run so on the other hand there now seems to be a broad agreement that the choice of how to conduct monetary policy has important consequence of eco- aggregate activity now we said that okay monetary policy affect the real economy but then how to conduct this monetary policy that actually gain more momentum so that means uh, that is also more important is not just the thing that just a monetary policy is going to affect influence the short term course of the real economy it also depend how do we conduct monetary policy what are the tools that we use and what are the tactics that we use so it's no longer an issue to downplay uh, second one is there has been considerable improvement in the underlying theoretical framework used for policy analysis 
so to provide theoretical underpinnings uh, underpinnings the literature has incorporated the techniques of dynamic general equilibrium theory uh, pioneered in real business cycle analysis so because of the loss of theoretical developments uh, we are now to know much well informed than earlier long before now we are well informed uh, of the relationship between different economic variables so let me now show you uh, how the the linkages between central bank tools policy instruments and uh, intermediate targets and goals of monetary policy so here as a monetary policy is the central bank use of various tools to influence money uh, interest rates and supply of credit in the economy as we discussed in the previous session uh, so the about the tools of central um, central bank uh, we have discussed open market operations discount policy uh, these are all the quantitative tools that the reserve on reserve requirement as well as uh, interest on reserves in addition to that some uh, non conventional uh, monetary policy tools like large scale asset purchase of the financial institutions and firms who are un, in distress uh, especially during crisis time and giving forward guidance that is giving information to the economic agents how the monetary policy the about the future course of monetary policy and these are the tools and in order to achieve the long term goals this is the ultimate goals that we already discussed price stability high employment economic growth uh, financial market stability interest rate stability foreign exchange rate stability uh, in order to achieve these ultimate goals over a period of time uh, several central banks have been using various central central banks have been using different policy instruments however there are some common agreement the tools the instrument used by one is reserve aggregate uh, influencing the reserves uh, including non borrowed reserves as well as uh, monetary base and non borrowed base of the monetary base uh, that is one and also uh, influencing the interest rates that is short term such as fed fund rates so using this one they they further target some intermediate targets since intermediate targets or intermediate goals also we can say but not the final goal that we mentioned here some intermediate go targets uh, that include one is targeting on monetary aggregates that is m1 m2 money supply aggregates in india for example m3 so the monetary aggregates targeting on monetary aggregates using these tools this and uh, through instruments then influencing this then to achieve these goals so either influencing on monetary aggregates or uh, versus uh, targeting on the intermediate goals of interest rates through which then we can make impact on the final uh, goals so what i am going to show here is that there are two intermediate targets one is called monetary aggregates that is money supply targeting and the other one is uh, interest rate targets that the influencing the short term and long term using the policy tools of interest rates based on this over uh, across the globe many central banks have been using uh, various monetary policy strategies so just to say that in order to influence attain these goals they can use either uh, monetary aggregates or interest rate uh, as the intermediate targets so we are going to discuss here what are the tools uh, what are the targets or strategy uh, that central banks have been following uh, in order to achieve the final goals that we mentioned here all these so there are various uh, monetary policy strategies and most of these uh, are mostly uh, competing strategies one is called monetary aggregates and the other one is interest rate targeting so one is called uh, monetary targeting that is money supply target or monetary aggregates target monetary uh, aggregates targeting that is one tar one policy other one is called interest rate targeting in order to achieve the final goal of uh, final goal uh, target mostly through mostly the mainly the interest rate that is another strategy and third one is called implicit angering that means without highlighting any nominal anger be it monetary targeting money supply or interest rate uh, targeting instead of mentioning any of these uh, making some implicit angering that also we'll discuss in appropriate context uh, these are the uh, three broad strategies of these these two 
that monetary targeting and interest rate targeting are considered as the two key uh, strategies of monetary policies. So, coming to the first one, uh, monetary aggregate targeting, uh, because the ultimate target of any monetary policy is to uh, influence the unemployment rate, uh, reduce the inflation rate and achieve growth in real GDP. So, here the ultimate targets that the monetary authority would like to control are macroeconomic variables. right? So, however, uh, in order to attain this, in order to achieve this, they have to use some intermediate targets. So, here if they use, if they target on monetary aggregate, then we can say that uh, the monetary policy strategy is uh, targeting the monetary aggregates. So, about intermediate target, an intermediate target is a variable that central bank controls not because the variable itself is important. The variable is important in its own right, but because by controlling it, the policy makers believe they are influencing the ultimate policy targets in a predictable way. The ultimate policy targets means whichever we mentioned here, that means uh, all this part that the unemployment rate, uh, growth in GDP, etc. So, here again the success depends on the ex exact relationship between money supply and goal variable. So, in order to explain this, how uh, increase that changes in monetary aggregates targeting the money supply, that is targeting the money supply or monetary aggregate, how does uh, it affects the final variable that is output. As you know that when the output increase, uh, employment also increase, so that is highly correlated. So, our point here is that uh, how does increase in money supply, changes in money supply affects uh, the final outcome, final target. So, here the intermediate target is money supply. So, the, the let us discuss the mechanism, uh, how the theoretical mechanism or the economic pathway through which uh, the intermediate target of money supply, changes in the intermediate target of money supply, how does it affect um, the final output, final target, ultimate target. So, here uh, as I let us recall what we had discussed in the previous sessions. So, we have seen that if there is suppose let us say money supply uh, has been increased. So, the central bank is following an expansionary monetary policy uh, for by increasing money supply that means uh, targeting the monetary aggregate uh, and increasing it. So, and then you know that when money supply has been increased and assuming other things remaining constant in the economy making this assumption that you know that when money supply has been increased and then there will be the money supply with the public, money supply with the in the economy increase, liquidity increases and as a result you know that people are content with more money. So, it creates a portfolio disequilibrium. Right. So, take the simple framework that we discussed in the previous sessions that means the total wealth uh, is equal to, uh, to the bond plus uh, money bond plus money with the people right these are the two assets uh, for sake of simplicity that we have taken that the total wealth or total asset is equal to uh, bond as well as money that they are holding so when money supply has been increased so suddenly when the money supply has been increased then you know that there is a portfolio disequilibrium because people demand money to meet their transaction and precautionary motive plus some amount they will be keeping if they anticipate a speculation if for speculative purpose speculative motive right that we have discussed in the previous session so what we can see here is that when they are having their money supply increase they are having more money with them so they will make a portfolio uh, reallocation of their wealth and as a result they will be since they have more money with them the demand for bond increases so that means uh, bond demand increases when the bond demand increases we can say that the price of bond uh, increases when the price of bond increases you know that rate of interest uh, decreases right so that means an increase in money supply leads to a decline in the rate of interest that means change in money supply due to the portfolio reallocation of uh, people by people then there is a change in interest rate that is in the first stage first phase 
and then in the second phase we can say that a decline in rate of interest you can see further that a decline in rate of interest this would lead to increase in investment you know why because investment means investment by the firm uh, on the purchase of capital equipment machines and tools and setting up of new factory expanding their capital equipments etc so that means when the rate of interest declines the cost of borrowing capital or cost of borrowing loanable fund decline for them so as a result there will be increase in investment so that means firms are expanding their production so that means they are hiring more laborers buying more raw materials then as a result you know that the gdp gdp increases so gdp increases means uh, again uh, the employment also uh, increases right so these are the in the second phase it happened like that so this is how looking based on this uh, theoretical pathway policy makers follow uh, the target of monetary aggregate targeting through uh, it is a intermediate target based on which uh, this mechanism uh, they aim to achieve the final goal the ultimate goal of uh, increase in gdp increase in employment etc this is one then the alternative strategy is uh, interest rate targeting. So, in the case of interest rate targeting, alternative to the targeting uh, monetary aggregate, the alternative is uh, to target an interest rate. So, the interest rate targeting is the current strategy of Federal Reserve and the central banks of other major industrialized economies. And as you know that the Fed fund rate determination in the US, uh, actually in, uh, the Fed fund rate determination in the US is nothing but uh, interest rate targeting. So, they are targeting the intermediate goal of uh, interest rate uh, in order to make a final influence or final influence on the ultimate goals of uh, output employment etc. So, we have seen that using monetary policy tools, uh, open market operation, discount window, uh, reserve requirements as well as interest rate on uh, reserve. They using all these tools they set a federal fund rate uh, that is the interest rate and accordingly um, they determine they aim to uh, make an influence on the final variables. So, an important some a few things that you need to remember here uh, because uh, keeping the federal fund rate uh, at the target level might require uh, the target federal fund rate means the interest rate at the target level might require large open market purchases or sales. So, that means they are changing the money supply. So, in that way we can say that okay, they are uh, they are focusing also on the uh, monetary aggregate, but actually only they are changing, but they are not putting any target on that. But in order to achieve a uh, interest rate target, they are changing uh, money supply in the economy. But the focus on interest rate is in fact an alternative to targeting monetary aggregate because the Fed cannot target both, uh, but they can target. Uh, either uh, interest rate and accordingly uh, do, doing open market operations and all uh, money supply will be changed. So, actually then actually they are focusing more on interest rate as the intermediate target and though they are making changes in monetary aggregate, but they are not targeting on that because Fed cannot do uh, both. Another thing the expectation here is that uh, short term interest rates can be observed contemporaneously uh, and be closely controlled by the Fed. So, open market does just look at the looks at the uh, computer screen and see the current Fed fund rate that is the short term rate. So, the FFR is a short term operating target, but money supply suppose if they target on the money supply monetary aggregates uh, is only observed with a lag of a week or two then only with uh, some error right. So, if money supply is a target then some other variable that is more frequently observable such as the level of the borrowed risks must serve as an operating target. So, because of the lag in observing uh, in money supply, so the, we can see that the interest rate target especially the short term interest rate target uh, can be a more feasible intermediate target for the central bank for the Fed. So, just to summarize here that the interest rate targeting focuses on the short term interest rates such as Fed fund rate that is in the US and repo rate in India. So, you also studied in the previous sessions that means the long term interest rates 
uh, are highly correlated with the short term interest rate so that uh, the um, here long term interest can also be observed uh, contemporaneously but cannot be closely controlled by the central bank because there are some uh, lags. So, in this session uh, we have discussed mainly the strategy the monetary policy strategies that have been used uh, across the globe and we discuss uh, monetary aggregate targeting and interest rate targeting and in the next session uh, we will continue this discussion and we will dis little dis discuss little bit more on this and then we will also um, review the experience of some countries in using uh, various strategies and tactics. Thank you. See you in the next session.